Today we're going to be talking about trains and railroads. Trains and railroads. There we go. The first trains we're going to talk about are some of the oldest trains, camel trains. See why I said trains instead of just railroads? I wanted to build up to it. The oldest trains were camel trains. Um, camels live about 50 years. Didn't know this, they can run almost 40 miles an hour. Not for very long, but they can do it. And then in that hump, or two humps, they have a large concentration of fat. The legend is they store water there. Actually what they store there is fat. And then they can metabolize that fat for both energy and water. And they have a very weird property in their blood cells. They're oval shaped. That allows them to flow through the veins even when they're up to 25% dehydrated. Amazing. Now, camels also have an extra set of eyelids and a nose lid to protect them in the sandstorms. They also reclaim the water. Have you ever done this? <sighs> okay. What you're doing there is taking water that comes out in your breath, condensing it on your glasses so you can clean it. There's a mechanism in the breathing mechanism of a camel to catch that water, process it back into their digestive system so that their breath is very dry, not wasting that water, blowing it out into the desert air. Uh, their body also reclaims biological water. Turns out urine has a very high concentration of good water and a little bit of really bad stuff in it. The processing system inside a camel processes all that good water out and the urine comes out thick as syrup with all the good water taken out and processed back. And the same on solid waste. Camel droppings are so dry that they can immediately be thrown into a fire and burned. Now, what does that have to do with camel trains? Nothing, but it sure was interesting to learn. There are two basic kinds of camels, the dromedary and the back train. Um, one's a little larger than the other. One has one hump, one has two. Um, and then there's a crossbreed that is often used. Turns out the crossbreed has a little better disposition um, sometimes they're bigger than the big ones, and only one hump. In 1856, the U.S. military imported a number of camels for use in the southwestern United States. It was a monumental failure. Um, the soldiers were used to working with horses and mules. They were not used to, to uh, camels. Camels are ornery and bullheaded. Um, some of them got away, although there were no more uh, wild camels in the southwest. We do use camels, however, in the um, areas of Afghanistan and so on, and they're used to this day. Camel trains have been around for centuries, and the whole idea of a camel train is you have one person with his camel at the beginning who knows where they're going, knows how to find their way through the desert or whatever, and everybody else follows. So you've got one camel in the front, and the train follows on behind. And camel trains are still used to some extent in the Sahara. <coughs> Another kind of train is the mule train. Uh, usually it's a male donkey crossed with a female horse. Could be the other way around, but not very often. And once in a great while, there is a mule that is fertile, but that is extremely rare. Mules have the advantage of being better disposition, they'll behave, much more endurance. They're not as strong as a horse, but they can work for hours longer than a horse. Mule can carry 20 to 25 percent of its own weight. Um, 20 percent in dead weight, 25 percent in live weight. I didn't know that, I'm just digging around finding this stuff. Um, so a person who's up to 25% of the weight of the animal could be carried easily. But dead weight, just baggage and so on, 
only about 20%. They can go places where a wagon can't go. Back in um, 1964, the Central American Mission had a radio station way back in the mountains of northern Guatemala. They needed some repair work and a new antenna system installed. And uh, they let me come down and do it for them. They paid my expenses and I had the fun of doing it. Way back in the mountains, in the good weather, we had to generate our own electricity, of course. In the good weather, the um, electricity, came, the so my throat doesn't wear out. Um, and I forgot my throat lozenges. In the good weather, the uh, diesel fuel came in by um, by ox cart, and in the bad weather, it came in on a mule train because the mules could get through even in the bad weather. Now, learning a little more about mules, you've probably all heard about the 20 mule team borax. <laughs> um, mining in Death Valley, long distance in terrible environment, turns out mules were the best animals for pulling. Now, get a load of this. A 20 mule team is only 18 mules and two horses. Now, remember what I was saying about horses? The horses are stronger than mules. They hitch two horses immediately in front of the wagons, and the tongue of the wagon would come between those two horses, and the strong horses were strong enough that they could steer the wagon, and that would have been hard to do with a mule. Then, there wasn't a tongue coming the rest of the way up. The rest of the way was a chain, and the mules were fastened two by two along that chain. And then there was one long leather rope coming from the driver to just the front mule, just one rope. And he would signal what he wanted done to that one lead mule by jerking the jerk line. That rope was called a jerk line. And he had signals for turn right, turn left, stop, and so on for signaling that one mule. The rest of the mules just followed along. They were trained to follow a bell. And so there were bells on the front mule. Now it came occasionally that a driver would get his wagon stuck. And he couldn't get it out with the 20 mules, 18 plus 2. Nothing he could do but stay there and wait for another mule team to come along. Then they'd unhitch the other mule team, put all 40 draft animals onto the one wagon, pull it out, and then there was a penalty to be paid. The guy who had to be rescued had to give his bells to the guy who saved him. Now, when he gets into town, everybody's laughing. You lost your bells. You're not a very good driver. And from there comes the expression, I'll be there with bells on. You've heard that song, that saying? Yeah, I'll be there with bells on. I'm not going to let anything stop me. I'll be there and I'll be in good mood because I'll have my bells. And then, of course, in the old western United States was wagon trains. Now, we see them on TV with lots of fast-running horses and stuff. <laughs> eh, a few horses, but mostly it was oxen. Um, oxen were more expensive, but... They were cheaper when you measured them by the pulling power. Wagons grouped together, again in a train. The wagon master leading, people behind didn't have to know how to get there. All they had to do was follow in the train. Usually a large group, that way they had mutual support. And uh, if they needed help, you know, somebody have a broken axle or whatever, there were others to help him and then, of course, for protection. Around the 1850s, the railroads came in and wagon trains ceased to exist. So, so far we have developed the train concept, a person or animal at the beginning making the decisions and others following behind. Well, let's look at the earliest known railroad. The Gulf of Corinth, if you want to get trade goods from the Gulf of Corinth over here to Athens, 
you have to go 300 miles around out into the Mediterranean and back, and the weather's not very good. Out into the Mediterranean and back, and the weather's not very good, but it's only five miles across the, the Isthmus of Corinth to, to get to Athens. So which would you take, 300 miles by sea or five miles by land? <laughs> Obviously, five miles by land is the way to go. At about 600 B.C., that is what they did. This was called the Dolkos, um, and it means in Greek, the across portage. This, um, pieces of that have been uncovered. And what apparently the people did was they chiseled paths in the rock, just the right distance apart for wagon wheels. And now you could pull a wagon along there. It would stay in that track. And it was very easy to pull compared to pulling it through dirt and mud. Um, centuries of wait. This was in use until uh, into the A.D. years. Um, centuries of, wa of wear and tear worn that down, so there are places where you can't tell whether it was chiseled or not. But boy, the tracks are there. Um, hard to do archaeological work on it. They're trying to learn more about it. But there's now a canal right parallel to this. And the canal people were not at all careful about archaeological remains. So part of the uh, Doikos has, has been destroyed. But that is the first, if you could call it that, a railroad or a railroad track that we know of in history. Small boats were actually able to be picked up and carried across. Larger boats unloaded their, um, their cargo and it went across the, the railroad. So now we have another concept, the concept of tracks. Make it easier to roll and make it easier to know which direction you're going. Another item from antiquity, a guy by the name of Hero of Alexandria. Sometimes his name is translated Heron. Notice his date, circa 10 to circa 70. So when Jesus was in the temple, talking to the elders as a boy. That's about the time that Hero was born. So that dates it a bit. He was an engineer and a bit of a semi-religious shyster. Um, and he did some things to help the priests of his day down and out in uh, uh, Egypt. Um, put on some interesting shows. We want to talk about just two of the things. What is the Aeola pile? Now notice what we have here. We have a big tub with a sealed top that's got water in it. So if you build a, build a fire under a big tub that's got water in it, what's going to happen? It's going to boil. And that steam is going to build up. You brought the steam up through two pipes into a copper sphere. And then there were two little jets coming out, one on each side, and it would spin. Wow! That is, as far as we know, the first time anyone used steam to make something move. And it was apparently just a toy. Um, doesn't appear to have been used for anything at all. Up until this time, air wind power had been used, but only used for ships, great sails. No one had used wind power on land just standing still. It appears that Hero was the first to develop a windmill. He used the windmill to pump air with a piston and blow it into an organ so the wind would make an organ play in the temple. Another thing, I don't have a picture of it, he had another item where fire would heat up a container of air and make a piston move and open the doors. Now, that had a very practical use. When the priests lit the fire on the altar, this is in Egypt now, these are heathen priests, pretty soon God would open the doors. Now, 
At the time of the apostles, Hero was this close to inventing the steam engine. He never thought to connect his steam power to his piston. If he had, he would have had a steam engine. Steam engine, amazing. Took another 1,600 years before we began to see that actually happen. Um, this really isn't a steam engine. This is really an atmospheric engine. It runs on air pressure. So air pressure limits how much power there is here. Now, you and I all know that a vacuum doesn't suck. It's really pressure on the other side. Okay, we're going to pretend it sucks. It just makes it easier to talk about. <laughs> if you had a cylinder with a piston all the way at the bottom of that and it was sealed off, it would be really hard to pull that piston up. <laughs> but what if you shot a little bit of low-pressure steam under that piston? That would let it come up pretty easily. And that's what we see happening here. <clears throat> so once the piston is up, we turn off the steam and we turn on a little bit of cold water. What happens if you spray cold water into a vessel of steam? <laughs> Condenses. Now you've got a vacuum to pull it back down. Okay, the air pressure pushes it down. Originally, these were used, as you might guess, to pump water out of mines. So this pole on the left here goes down into a mine and operates pumps down in the mine. And there may have been several levels of pumps because the pumps couldn't raise more than 40 or 50 feet, so it would raise it up and then there'd be another pump and so on. And when these machines were first made, there were workmen, usually little boys, who were responsible for operating these two valves. And they would sit there all day, run the steam, run the water, run the steam, run the water. And eventually, uh, they automated the whole thing. Tremendously inefficient by any kind of standard, but it didn't need muscle. This is the first practical use that didn't need muscle. You didn't need people working pumps, or what was often the case was horses or oxen going around a merry-go-round and a belt coming off of that and operating the pump or something. So this was a huge step forward. Very, very inefficient, but it worked. About 50 years later, 1769, James Watt was asked to repair an atmospheric engine. He got it going again, and then he was looking at it and said, you know, I could get more power if instead of using air pressure, I put steam on top of that. Yeah. There's a little problem. You put steam on one side of the piston and push it over, then put steam on the other side. It's got steam on this side to, to push against. So you have to open a valve to let that steam out. So if you've got a vessel of steam and you open a valve, what does it sound like? And then you put steam in the other side and push it over and and then you put steam in the other side and push it over and you and you put those on a train and a locomotive and you've got from whence we get choo-choo train. Yeah. Now, James Watt did not apply this to land vehicles. He came up with this, made a lot of uh, improvements, and he applied it to, to ships. However, it was soon realized that this engine could be made to spin a shaft or spin a pulley. So now, how do we thrash grain and so on? You thresh with a threshing machine that's run by these oxen walking in circles to spin the, the wheel in the threshing machine. If we had a steam engine, that steam engine could be connected and we wouldn't have to have those oxen or the, the horses. We could just spin it directly from the steam engine. We could use the horses for something else. So we bring the steam engine over to Farmer Brown's connect it up to a threshing machine and thresh for a couple of days. And when all of his threshing is done, we hitch up a team of horses, haul the steam engine to Farther Farmer Jones, hook it up there and thresh for a few days. And during all this thrashing time, the, the, the horses are free to do other things. 
progress here. Hmm. We have a steam engine that's going round and round. And we'd like to have the wheels go round and round. Well, let's connect them up. And now we have what's called a traction engine. That happened about 1850. It was slow, but boy, could it pull. Now, when you're through working at Farmer Brown's, you didn't need to bring in a team at all. You just shift the thing into gear, and it'll go two, three miles an hour down the road and get to Farmer Jones without a team. Can you believe that? That steam engine is going down the road without any horses. Amazing thing. Then somebody else realized how incredibly powerful these steam engines were and threw a, a plow on the back, drove it across the field. Sure enough, you could pull two, three, four plows. You could plow faster with this than you could with a team of horses or oxen. Amazing, amazing thing. So what have we invented so far? We've got the concept of trains so that one person or one engine or whatever at the front can lead what's behind. We have the concept of tracks to make things easier to roll. And now we have the concept of steam, which allows us to have power that does not come from muscles. We no longer have to draw our power from horses or oxen. Pretty close to having a train. Early 1500s, um, archaeologists have now found something from the early 1500s in Eastern Europe. Notice this thing. It's got wooden wheels, but it rolled on wooden tracks, which allowed it to travel pretty easily. So we're starting to get towards um, a train, the modern railroad. Um, closer to that in Eastern Europe and in the United States was a stagecoach with fixed wheels that rolled along on a track. Now one horse could do the work of four or six. So we're making headway. This concept of wood was extended to roads. That's the corduroy road. Plank roads were around from about 1840 to about the 1920s. So you put logs crosswise, usually cut them in half, and then put some sand on it, and a car could drive over those. And of course the sand wore a little bit. You boom, 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 boom. So you go slow, but going slow over a rough road consistently was sure better than being stuck in the mud. Big step in the right direction. Then looking at this, someone decided, you know, if we're real careful about how we're operating, we could cover just a portion of that with iron rail. Uh, iron is much stronger than wood. Um, it worked well for light trains or um, cars that only carried a few tons and engines that were only a few horsepower. But once we started carrying heavy loads and they started putting 10, 20 tons in a car and having dozens of horsepower, uh, the rail was chewed up. You can see this rail's chewed on the top and broken. I cheated. I was not able to find an illustration of an iron rail. So if you look close, look at the um, crystalline structure, you'll discover that this is really a steel rail. Now, how do we keep the train on the track? You know, you don't want it to rock, run three feet and then fall off. Well, up until recently, I believed what most people believe, that that's why there were flanges on the inner edge of the wheels. So if it got too far to the left, it would bump on the left rail and come back, and if it got too far to the right, it would bump on the right rail and come back. Turns out, on a properly maintained railroad, the flanges don't touch the rail. Amazing. Picture, if you would, a solid axle with a big wheel on the left side and a little wheel on the right side. I roll that, and what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to go to the left. What if I wanted it to go to the right? I could switch the wheels around, and then it would go to the right. And if I had the same side wheels, same seals, had the same size wheels on both sides, it would go straight. 
Now, what if I could find a way, while I'm going down the track, if I start to move a little bit to the right, I make the right hand wheel a little bigger and the left hand wheel a little smaller and it brings me back. And what if I start to go to the left and I make the left wheel a little bigger and the right one a little smaller? That would bring me back. Turns out there's a way to do that. Look at the contour of these wheels. The outer edge of railroad wheels has a smaller diameter than the inner edge. So if the train starts to get a little bit off of dead center, it ends up having a big wheel on one side and a little wheel on the other, and that brings them back. Now, you want to see if that's true? Next time you get out by a railroad, take a look at the track. You will see that the top of the track has no rust at all because the wheels are going along there. Now look at the inner edge of the tracks. You'll find it's rusty. Why? Because the flange never touches. The only reason the flange is there is for protection for high wind or short turns. Under normal conditions, a train would stay on the track with no flanges on the wheels at all. Amazing. I didn't know that until just recently. So, now we've got a way to make the wheels bigger and smaller, depending on what they need to do. Well, that's great. We got a low friction way of running. We're going like crazy down the track. How do we stop this thing? Oh, my. This is a famous picture. This is... Um, I don't remember the date, 1800s in Paris, the uh, railroad required that the engineer stop before he came to the station, test his brakes, and then go on in. This train was behind schedule, and the engineer thought, I'm going to skip the brake check. <laughs> Bad move. He got in, put on the brakes, and all he had was engine brakes. And the engine wheels, wheels slid. And all those cars behind pushed him right off the end, and it was up on the second floor. <coughs> Obviously, if we're going to have more than five or six cars, we're going to have to have something more than engine brakes. Well, first solution was to put brakemen along the train. Every four or five cars, a brakeman on the train. I was kind of <coughs> interested to see this picture. Uh, this is, was uh, from a book published in 1859, and as I was preparing for this, I was reading a republish of the 100th anniversary of that book. Um, so the book, The American Railroads, will be in our library probably by tomorrow, so if you want to check it out, it's there. So now we've got a train going along the track, and we need to slow down, so the engineer says, toot, toot. And the brakeman puts on the brake, and then he jumps up, runs to the next car, puts on the brake, jumps up, runs to the next car, puts on the brakes, and duck if you come to a tunnel. Yeah. Lost a few of them that way. They were so busy, you know. You got a man in a tunnel, the tunnel wins every time. And then when it was time to take the brakes off, another toot from the engine, and the brakeman would have to go along releasing the brake. And take a look at this picture closely. They're running along those wooden walks in the snow. Yeah. It would be much better if we could find a way to let the engineer do it. If we could find a way to have the train go along. And then when the engineer wanted to slow down, just have him put the brakes on. And have the train slow down. Well... Let's put a pipe down the length of the train. We'll have a hose between each car, each two cars. And when the engineer wants to stop the train, all he has to do is hit that pipe with compressed air. Compressed air puts on the brake, and the train stops. When he's ready to go, he takes off the compressed air, and the train goes on. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> What could possibly go wrong? What if we were going up a hill and the connection broke? Now we've got those last two cars. No air pressure, so there's no brakes. 
And down it goes. Downhill like crazy. Till it crashes, probably. Maybe we'd better find a better way. Well, fortunately, along came George Westinghouse. 1868. George Westinghouse invented what was called the triple valve. The gist of it was, now you put on air pressure to turn the brakes off, and you reduce air pressure to turn the brakes on. Yeah, interesting. So now what happens if the train brakes? Now if the train brakes, the air leaks out of these brakes, and it stops. And the cars that were cut loose simply stop. This is what's called fail-safe. Many people think fail-safe means it's safe against failure. What fail-safe means is it fails to a safe condition. So if there is a failure, the safe condition is brakes stopping the train. Westinghouse brakes have been improved over the years. As I was preparing for this, I watched several really, well, this shows how weird I am, interesting movies put out by the Westinghouse Brakes Company and the different things they had done to allow for longer trains and so on. Well, well, we found out how to stop our train. Now let's find out how to pull it. Um, 1802, a fellow by the name of Richard Trevithick in Great Britain discovered that he could put a steam engine on wheels, connect them, and use it as a locomotive. I'm going to try very hard today to say engine when I mean a motor kind of device, and locomotive when I mean a vehicle that pulls. I may slip because we typically say engine when we mean locomotive, but I'll try. He could pull passengers and freight. He pulled a mixed consist of passenger and freight. They went nine miles in only four hours. <laughs> yeah, but that was just something. No horses. No oxen. The limit was how fast he could make steam. He could have gone faster, but the steam boiler would just boil off what little steam it had, and then there was nothing but cool water. He had to wait for the, the fire to build up some more steam and then go on. In 1829, George Stephenson, also in Great Britain, came up with an improvement. Instead of just building the fire under a pot of water, he built the fire behind it and then sent the output of that fire through pipes, fire tubes, that went through the water. So instead of just having a couple square feet of contact between the heat and the water, he had dozens of square feet. So he could produce steam a lot faster, and he was able to go at the incredible speed of 13 miles an hour. And that was really something. Now in the U.S., E.L. Miller, a couple of years later, built a locomotive. This was the first one built in the United States. And as you can imagine, he wanted to run the pressure as high as he dared to get as much horsepower as he could. But if somebody ran the pressure too high, he had a valve to let that pressure out. And the pressure valve would go for long periods of time. And that really bothered the engineer. So he wired it shut. <laughs> what do you think happened? Not much engineer. Boom. Yes, we lost the engine and the engineer. It lasted about six months. Just shortly after that, Matthias Baldwin came onto the scene. He built engines. He and his successors built engines for 140 years. Um, he was a jeweler and an inventor, and he ended up merging the engine with the vehicle to produce the kind of locomotive we're used to now. Instead of having an engine that spins and then gears or um, chains or something to run the wheels, he connected it all so that the flywheel was the drive wheel. So that was a big improvement. Well, you know what happened. No matter how good you make it, somebody wants it better and somebody wants it bigger. So now we ended up 
needing to make them so long that the wheels couldn't make the curves, even with the flanges. And on a short curve, you'll hear the flanges hit and they squeal as they turn. Um, subway trains do that all the time because they have such short turns. So what they started doing was enlarging the engine, but out under the front, they could now put a cow catcher on. It didn't really catch the cows. It threw them off. Killed the cow, but at least it didn't throw the train off the track. Um, the pistons, the uh, smokestack, the fire, the uh, spark arrestor, all of those had their weight carried by these extra pilot wheels up front. So now we can have the weight of the engine concentrated back here doing the work and then these wheels guide it around the track and carry the non-working portion. Want to get even bigger? Well, let's extend the, the engine on the, let's extend the locomotive on the other direction. So now we still have the engine in the middle of the locomotive, but the firebox and the cab stick out the back. And that's trailer wheels out there holding the cab and the firebox. So you can get a pretty good sized engine this way. Uh, we've got one right here in Fort Wayne still operating. We'll see a picture of that coming up. But that's not big enough. Why not put two steam engines on the same locomotive? And this is called a compound. So you can see here, eight drive wheels followed by eight more drive wheels. It's actually four actually two steam engines on one chassis. And the way they ran that is the live steam, the hottest, most powerful steam off of the boiler, ran the back engine, and then the exhaust of that engine was piped to the front engine, reused so they could get almost twice the power and twice the traction. From here, if you want to go any bigger, you're going to have to have two locomotives or three locomotives on the train, and each one of those locomotives needs its own crew, and they have to coordinate, so it's, it's a bit of a problem. This is about reaching the limit of what we can do on a steam locomotive. Steam locomotives, by today's standards, are rather inefficient. They use a lot of coal, they use a lot of water, and they are a lot of work. The most obvious work is the fireman who has to shovel. On the larger ones, there were two firemen to shovel fast enough to keep the coal in there. Then they put in an auger to bring the, the coal automatically from the coal car, dump it in, but of course it dumped it in the wrong place. <laughs> so the fireman was there with a steam-operated blower to blow steam to throw those chunks of, of coal to the proper part of this great big huge firebox. One of the problems was you need about seven times as much water as you need coal. The original tenders were built with about that ratio. A big coal bin and a monstrous water tank. They realized quite quickly that that was not an efficient way to do it. So they carry a lot of coal and just 40 or 50 miles worth of water. And then every 30 miles or so, we would have a water tank. The water tank would usually be filled by a windmill. And it just ran and ran and ran, pumping either from a well or a stream. And that tank would gradually fill. And then a train would come along and need water. Notice the size of that tank compared to the locomotive. That tank is huge. So then they would bring the, the spout down and dump several thousand gallons of water into the tender, pick it up, and then they could go on. Now, there were some towns that were so small that they didn't have a water tank. So the crew would stop there, they needed water, they would use leather buckets, they'd stop near a stream, and they'd go down and put the, the, the bucket in the water, and they jerked the bucket out of the water, dumped the water into the tender. This was called jerking water. And where did they do this? In jerkwater towns. So you ever wonder where the term jerkwater came from? That's it. It's a railroad term. Jerkwater towns. Sure would be nice if we could pick up that water 
without stopping. What if we put that that uh, big tank on wheels and ran along next to the track and poured the water in that way? Uh, nah, not, not too practical. So what they did was they built troughs between the rails. And these would be close to a mile long. So when you needed water, instead of having a tank, they would have a trough of water between the rails. The train would slow down to about 25 miles an hour. The firemen would lower a scoop that would scoop water out of this trough and then pick it up and they could continue on without ever having to, having to stop. Pretty good. Why didn't they just use diesel engines? Good grief, diesel invented his engine forever ago. Primarily because in those days, Diesel engines were so huge that you really couldn't fit one in a locomotive very well. And as engines became more efficient, they were pro finally able to put them into a locomotive. In the 40s, they finally were able to make small locomotives with diesel. Big ones still had to have steam, but the little ones ran on diesel. Uh, when I was a boy in the 40s, yeah, that dates me. I'm younger than any of you guys. Um, we began seeing diesel switchers. So these would be used in the railroad yard. A train would come in with maybe a hundred cars, and they were all going different places. So you have to bring a switcher in, take the first car, put it in the Chicago track, take the next car, put it in the Cleveland track, take the next two cars, put them in the Chicago track, and so on. It's a switch engine. So when I was a boy, when we heard the word diesel related to railroads, it was always a diesel switcher. That was all they were used for. However, diesel engineering continued to improve. Nowadays, that's all we see. No more steam locomotives. And we can now do what we couldn't do with steam locomotives. We can connect multiple locomotives together with one crew. Here we have six locomotives with one crew. All six slaved together, one set of uh, controls operating the engines, the, uh, the electrics, the air pressure, all working from all six of them, all at the same time. Well, be nice. How are we going to carry passengers? We've got an engine, but you can't carry very many people on that engine. I bounced. There we are. <laughs> the first train cars were simply made by stagecoach companies. And they put big round, obviously round wheels, um, metal wheels fixed. And now it would run on the track. Pretty good. Uh, reading diaries of people who traveled back in the late 1800s when this was happening, we found a few drawbacks. Notice the smoke. It was not as genteel as this picture shows it. The smoke was all around the people. They were breathing smoke the whole way, and that was the good part. They were also getting hit with ashes and bits of fire. So there were, there were burning pits, pieces of fire coming out of the top and falling down on the passengers. So the passengers, hey, they, they fix that. They put up an umbrella. And by the time they went to this next station, the umbrella had been burned up by those little pieces. So we um, had, to, had to improve this a little bit. Now notice how these, these vehicles are connected together with a chain between them. So what's going to happen when the engine starts? The first, yeah, the first chain is going to tighten up and it's going to jerk that first car a little bit. And it's going along now, the next, tra the next chain will jerk even harder, and the next one even harder. And by the time you got to the third or fourth car, the jerk at starting up would actually throw people off the, the seat. Now what happens when you stop? The only brake was in the engine. So now, the first car rams into the tender, and the next car runs, runs into the first car, and the third car into the second, each one of those getting worse. And again, throwing people off the seat. And then, of course, they were out in the weather. 
probably be a good idea to improve that a little bit. It wasn't long before they modified the concept of a box car to make a car for people to ride in. Um, so this is a closed car. The only way you could get air is open the windows, so you still got smoke, but not very much ashes and no fire. So this was a tremendous improvement. Um, this came on right about the time of the big immigration. People were moving from Europe, coming to the U.S., and then moving on out to the West Coast. And they could travel by train and get across the country in a couple of weeks instead of three or four months. Tremendous improvement. But the cars they were traveling in, uh, to keep the fare, to keep the price down, they were just essentially box cars, um, wooden seats, wooden shelves. These people were traveling with their belongings so they could spread their own blankets out on those shelves and use them for beds. Not real great, but it worked. You could get across the country that way, quickly and cheaply. If you're willing to pay more, you could get contoured seats. You can make them into a rather comfortable bed. There were beds overhead that folded out of the way in the daytime would come down. Mattresses. Incredible, wonderful things. But it was still just a box. And what's that box going to be like in the winter? Well, cold. So they heated it with a wood stove, or with a, a coal stove. Usually coal, sometimes wood, but usually coal, because railroads, of course, had a lot of coal. If you had a seat near the, the stove, and there was often one in each end, you were hot. And if you had a seat in the middle, you were cold. Oh well, not as bad as being outside in the weather. The big thing was in an accident. If there was an accident, these stoves would tip over and start a fire. And in many accidents, more people perished from the fire than from the accident. Again, not real good. Fortunately, in 1864, along came George Pullman. Pullman had seen the canal boats that were really quite luxurious. And he said, I can do that on the railroad. So he began building luxury cars for the railroad. He also had another invention, which may have been good, may have been bad, the company town. Uh, a wonderful help, ripe for... Uh, uh, productivity and for abuse. Uh, we're not going to go into the company town, but that uh, appears to have also started from Pullman. Now, just as Mr. Pullman made his first car, his first palace car, President Lincoln was assassinated. Pullman donated the use of one of his cars to carry Mr. Lincoln to his final rest. And the, the car traveled around the U.S. and people would thousands line up by the track just to watch this car go by. They couldn't even see, obviously couldn't see Mr. Lincoln's body, nor could they see the casket just to see this car go by and know that that's where President Lincoln's body was. Uh, this gave the Pullman cars a tremendous um, advertising boost. I don't know that that's the reason Mr. Pullman did it, but boy, that was the effect. Pullman's motto was luxury for the common man. So he made cars the whole range. Here we see some cars that had cushioned seats, decoration, windows that opened and closed. Incredible. Really, really nice. And another thing in Pullman's cars were beds, bunks where people could sleep. Maybe they were converted from the seats. You know, some of these are converted from seats. Others were up the wall. And Mr. Pullman supplied the workers. So the railroads didn't own the Pullman cars. Mr. Pullman owned the cars. He hired the employees. And then he bought rail time or train time and the trains hauled his cars around. So the train companies made money, Pullman made a lot of money. And the Pullman porters, because they worked for Mr. Pullman, made the beds, unmade them in the morning, did other things to serve the people. Now as the years went by, the Pullman cars began to have 
um, compartments that people could rent. They could be as small as the old slumber coach. I often traveled between Chicago and New York. If I had the time, I would come back by train and I would usually rent a slumber coach. It cost, I think, $7 more than a coach ticket. And uh, it was a little teeny compartment, but it was all to myself. It was wonderful. Lean back. Wonderful. Or, you know, it could be big enough for a whole family. Pullman also introduced the dining car. Fine food. And I mean fine food. With a good view. Um, I used to travel from Fort Wayne to Chicago quite often. And about every second or third trip, I would give myself the luxury of breakfast in the diner. Mm. And then um, I would guess it was about uh, 2010, maybe a little before, all of a sudden the quality just went down. It was instant coffee served from a plastic pitcher, microwave meals with railroad quality silverware and linen. And it took me several months of asking questions, and I finally found a conductor who spilled the beans for me. Uh, Amtrak decided to save money, and they fired the dishwashers and went to all plastic plates and microwave meals. Oh, well. Of course, if you're going to have a fine quality rolling restaurant, you need a fine quality kitchen to serve it. And that was another one of Pullman's inventions. Now, to take care of these people, many of whom were snooty and demanding, where could Mr. Pullman find people who would take care of people? They would be reliable, give elite service. Pullman was the largest single employer of freed slaves. Here were people who had lived under slavery and they'd learned how to kowtow to the nasty manager. Now they could get paid for that skill and use it to serve people. So Pullman was the largest employer of free slaves for many decades. What, what, what was the date of Pullman? One of the dirty little secrets of giving these kinds of speeches is I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't need the slides as I'm going along. When I was teaching for IBM, I really knew the stuff. But here, for these subjects, I learned them in the weeks before, and then I make the presentation. So I think it was 1864. And of course, the Vista View cars, wonderful. What's the future of railroad? Well, there's no getting around the fact that the most efficient way to move cargo over land is steel on steel. Steel wheels rolling on steel track. Um, at slow speeds, an ocean liner uses less fuel per ton mile, um, but not at the speeds they normally go. In the, in the US, trains max out at about 80 miles an hour. I've set in a passenger train with a GPS watching 79 right on the money. Um, and the reason being, go above that, it takes a very expensive, a lot of money, to build tracks that will handle speeds faster than that. Because they have to be so incredibly precise, straight and level. In Taiwan, today, they have done that. They have made a set of track over about 200 miles. And they have speeds on a daily basis approaching 200 miles an hour. Yeah, that's something. I uh, remember long ago watching um, a gun smoke. Remember gun smoke? Uh, yeah. yeah, and I, I don't know if it was Chester or Festus talking about this new train. It can go a mile in a minute. You gotta get the guy all mixed up inside. It can't be healthy. And I look at that and I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Notice how one of the ways they did it? A locomotive weighs hundreds, four or five hundred tons. Four or five hundred tons, no locomotive. Runs on electric motors, electric motor on each car, and they draw the power from the catenary. So that's one of the ways they were able to get that speed, get rid of a lot of tons that weren't needed. And then, of course, incredibly accurate track work. To go faster than that, you have to actually have to get rid of the wheels. 
get a train that doesn't have wheels. Yes, it has wheels for use in the station at slow speed. Remember in high school when you were learning magnets? You bring two magnets together and they pull right together. And then you turn one around and you bring them together and they push us apart. That's the principle on which these trains travel. They have repulsive magnets between the track and the car. And the car, when they're in motion, rides an inch or so above the track on a magnetic film. So it's magnetism, magnetic levitation, maglev, that holds this up. This one train in Shanghai has some stretches where it hit, actually hits 270 miles an hour. Incredibly fast. Fort Wayne was a big railroad town. Not so much anymore. Um, in fact, when I was getting trains to Chicago, we had to drive up to Waterloo, which was 35 miles. I think most of us have seen the old nickel plate station. Um, nickel plate was merged into the Pennsylvania, so this became Pensy. Um, we had four train stations. I didn't know that. I knew there were two. Turns out there were four. Very inefficient use of space and, and personnel. So the four of them were merged into one Union Station, and then when the end of passenger train, this became Baker Street Station. Gigline has been a very good friend of LLV. Um, they now have their corporate headquarters there, and they use the Grand Hall as a banquet uh, facility. So at the last uh, LLV annual meeting, I think we were sitting about at that table. Uh, believe it or not, there was a time when waiting for trains was even worse than it is now. When we drive around town, we end up waiting for trains quite often. It seems like all the time now, but it was much worse in the past. Everything was at street level, and so there was a, a, a move undertaken to elevate the nickel plate. Elevate the nickel plate. So they were building bridges to pass over roads, digging out for viaducts, and eventually at least the busy crossings were elevated. Now looking at this, the important thing for me is to see that 55 Chevy back there. When I got out of Bible school in 1963, I bought a 55 Chevy. Boy, that was a nice car. Any man's best car was that first one he bought. Remember those? We got the 57 right there. Uh, yeah, I think that is. That's a Chevy. On the right, right there. Is that a 57? I don't know. When you get to finding the difference between a 55 and a 57, I know they all had four wheels. And look at those white wall tires back when they really had white walls. Amazing. Trains in Chicago today. Trains in Fort Wayne today are either museum pieces or freight. But here we have uh, the Fort Wayne uh, Railroad uh, Memorial Society. I have the URL there if you're interested. So browse to fortwaynerailroad.org. They have a lot of stuff. The big thing is the actual Berkshire engine, um, number 765. For political reasons, this engine was relabeled as 767 because the politicians needed to have it to break the, the, the ribbon on uh, the elevated nickel plate. And 767 was a, a well-known engine, but it was in bad repair. So nickel plate just changed the name. <laughs> it was the 765, but they called it the 767. Then later on it went back to being the 765. It ended up in a park, uh, rain, snow, rust, until it was bought and donated to the Fort Wayne uh, Railroad Historical Society. And they decided not to do a cosmetic rebuild, but to do a functional rebuild. Incredibly expensive. This has been through, two, through an overhaul in addition to that rebuild. But this is one of the few operating steam engines in the United States 
that is properly licensed to operate on mainline track. There are engines around, locomotives around, that can run around the track on a museum ground or maybe around local or state, but not on national track. This engine has been, this locomotive has been restored in every way possible to its original condition. The only variations are those required for safety laws. Obviously it has better radios than it had in the 40s and safety equipment. This is available for other railroads. It's rented or leased to other railroads to use for pulling excursions. Um, lives here in Fort Wayne. A lot of other good stuff at the railroad. Now let's talk about some railroad music. Uh, probably the best known railroad song is I've Been Working on the Railroad. Um, near as we can tell, it started out in 1894. I want you to remember that date. Don't go asking me for it later on. Okay. okay. In 1924, it was actually recorded by a group called the Sand Hills 16. But a little more research shows that it was originally based on a song called the Trestle Song. So let's look at this song. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. That makes sense. Railroad was hard work and they worked long days. I've been working on the railroad just to pass the time away. Come on. You can't find anything better to do with your time than work on a railroad? Can't you hear the whistle blow? And that goes back to the trestle song. If you're working on the railroad and a train comes by, you can just step back. Not a big deal, the train goes by. If you're working on a trestle and you just step back, what happens? Yeah, 100 feet down to the rocks in the river below. They were always signaled way in advance, and they were listening for the, the whistle. When the whistle sounded, the men would scatter to the opposite ends of the trestle, be out of the way so the train could come through. So this goes back to the trestle song. Rise up so early in the morn. Yeah, long day. Can't you hear the captain shouting? The captain would not have been saying sweet things like, Dinah, blow your horn. <laughs> the captains were known for having, um, shall we say, colorful language. <laughs> Dinah, won't you blow? Dinah, blow? I thought it was the engineer blowing the horn. <laughs> Turns out, the section about Dinah was a completely separate song, and somehow they got the two together. Now, when you hear, when I hear the word Dinah, I think of "See the USA in your Chevrolet," uh, written in 1949. I just looked it up, Teddy. 1949, and uh, it was to advertise the 1950 Chevrolet. Turns out, Dinah was a term used back in slavery days to reference just some female slave whose name you didn't know. So the whites who just didn't care, or they were too good to learn the names of their slaves, any woman they would call Dinah. Um, the original song, Dinah Won't You Blow, Dinah Won't You Blow, is, um, shall we say, a little bawdy. I found it in my research, and we're certainly not going to sing it here today. <laughs> Other versions of the song, there was the hobo version. I've been working on in, let me try again. I've been living in the boxcars, I'm a hobo now. I've been living in the boxcars, which the yard bulls won't allow. Who are the yard bulls? Yeah, the railroad police. And they were none too gentle. No Miranda rights. You know, if they found a bum, they wanted to get him off the track. They didn't want him stealing, and they didn't want him getting free rides. Brother, can you spare a quarter? Buy me something good to eat. Brother, can you spare a nickel? Till I'm on my feet. Another version is the railroad workers version. I'll be owner of this railroad one of these here days. I'll be owner of this railroad and I swear your pay I'll raise. I'll invite you to my mansion. 
will feed on goose and terra pit. What worker knows what terra pit is? I don't know what it is. It's what? It's turtle. Turtle. Why not? Why not? It's turtle. Why not? I'll invite you to the race track when my ship comes in. I grew up in Michigan, and in Michigan, Minnesota, a few other timber areas, we had a mythical hero, Paul Bunyan. Bigger than life, a wonderful uh, uh, goal to, st to strive to, to be as good as Paul, Paul Bunyan. In the railroad area, the, the equivalent would have been John Henry. John Henry was a legendary railroad worker. I found almost 40 verses of different, in different versions of his song. Relax, I'm not going to do all of them. <laughs> Historians have actually located two men in historical records who might have been the basis of John Henry, one in Virginia, one in Texas. We don't know. But John Henry is the story of a steel-driving steel man. <coughs> all the versions of John Henry start out in some fashion with John Henry as a baby and a premonition, either John or his mother or somebody, knowing that John was going to be a steel-driving man. When John Henry was a little baby, sitting on his daddy's knee, he picked up a hammer in his little right hand, said, this hammer's going to be the death of me, Lord, Lord, this hammer's going to be the death of me. There are a lot of different versions of that, but they all start off with him as a baby, interested in hammering, and knowing that he was going to be a steel-driving man for all of his life. Uh, there are several other verses, a lot of other verses that come here. I'm just going to skip over them and hit them briefly. John Henry was a powerful man. He could swing a 15-pound hammer harder than anybody else. When he swung that hammer down, swooshing through the air with such speed that people thought there was a tornado in the area. When he hit the, st the steel, the steel of the hammer against the steel of the spike, sparks flew, and people thought the hills were on fire. John Henry was a steel-driving man. Now there are some variations on just how this steam drill got into the story. Um, in the first place, Let's talk about a steam drill. It wasn't a steam drill. It had to be a steam hammer. A drill is used for drilling into the side of a mountain at the end of a tunnel. With a steam drill, it would drill a hole. Before the steam drill, a man would hold a drill, and two men with sledgehammers, who he trusted a lot, would hit that drill. Man one, man two. Man one. Man too. And between each hit, the guy holding the, the drill would rotate it a little bit. And they would do that for hours. And at the end of many hours, they would have several holes in the rock at the end of the tunnel. And then it would be packed with explosive. In the early days, it was gunpowder. Uh, then they worked a little bit with nitroglycerin, much more powerful, but oh, it was wicked stuff. A lot of accidents. And then once Nobel learned how to handle how to tame nitroglycerin by making it into dynamite, dynamite was used. So the explosion would blast, and then men would come in and shovel out all of that broken rock. And then they'd have to do more chiseling to square out, get the right shape, and then they'd start again. That doesn't quite fit with the race that the song has for John Henry. So obviously it was not a steam drill. The steam drill was obviously a steam hammer. Um, there are a couple, well, there are several, but there are a couple of main versions of what happened. One is the steam drill company came to the captain and said, I got a steam drill, it's so good, it'll be faster than any of your men. And the captain says, You ain't seen my John Henry. Ah, but it's faster than him. Bet you 50 bucks. And that's how the contest got set up. The other, kind, the other view is that the uh, captain just brought the steam drill and, and they began the, the race and so on. The captain said to John Henry, 
Gonna bring that steam drill down. Gonna bring that steam drill out on the job. Gonna whop that steel on down, Lord, Lord. Gonna whop that steel on down. Um, interestingly, many of the verses and versions of this song were incredibly racist. I was absolutely amazed. Um, it wasn't until just the last three or four years I realized that uh, uh, John Henry, uh, the legend, was probably black. I just, you know, he's a man, you know. Um, turns out there is a lot of white against black, the white captain and the black workers and so on in these songs, uh, in the John Henry songs. Um, so we've got the, the steam drill. The captain brings it out. And, of course, you've probably seen some of the versions on TV where John Henry walks up to the drill. He don't look so special to me, and so on. Eventually, the day, day comes for the contest. Um, they're lined up, and notice they're not drilling here. Steam drill is really a steam hammer. Now the men that invented the steam drill thought he was mighty fine. But John Henry made 15 feet. Steam drill only made nine, Lord, Lord. Steam drill only made nine. Again, the, the legends diverge at this point. Some say that John Henry worked so hard on this contest that he just plans to lay down and died. I prefer those that show John Henry beating the steam drill and going on spending the rest of a fruitful life driving, on, driving steel. Um, behind every good man, there's a good woman. Polly Ann. Um, I had a hard time finding a good picture that I thought pictured Polly Ann. I, I took this one from the uh, Disney uh, cartoon of John Henry. But Polly Ann was a faithful, strong woman behind her man. And whenever he needed something, she was there to help. I tried to find a modern equivalent. Um, had to do a lot of digging until I found a, a picture of a modern equivalent of a, a Polly Ann who stood behind her man in all these difficult times. John Henry had a little woman. Her name was Polly Ann. John Henry took sick and he went to his bed. Polly drove steel like a man. Lord, Lord, Polly drove steel like a man. They went on with their life, and finally, the prophecy came true. John Henry drove steel right up until the last day of his life. And um, Polly Ann took John Henry and laid him to rest. They took John Henry to the graveyard. And they buried him in the sand. And every locomotive comes a rumble and by, says, Yonder lies a steel driving man. Lord, Lord, yonder drives a steel driving man. And that is the legend of John Henry. One other legend I'd like to talk about is the legend of the Wabash Cannonball. And that's the words I passed out to you. Um, the Wabash Cannonball is based on an old hobo legend. It is thought that when a hobo died, the mythical Wabash Cannonball came to carry him on to his reward in heaven. So the Wabash Cannonball is not a railroad song. It's actually a hobo song. And let's, let me show you a little of the background so you understand the words. Railroad signals um, are multicolored, and in the original versions, they had the different colored lenses with a kerosene lantern behind them. Nowadays, they're different colored lenses with an electric light bulb behind them. The through light is on the top. So that's called the highball. A train that can go through has the highball. Others have lower balls, which may tell them to slow down or stop. If a train is in the station, and there's an express train coming through behind that will not be stopping at the station. The main line track is going to be red. Then they get that other train off to one side on a siding, switch the tracks, 
and now the green highball is on. And as the engineer on the express train comes into the station, he can see that green highball, knows he doesn't have to slow down, he can keep right on going. So there's the term highball. They were also, those express trains were often known as cannonballs. Because they would go like a cannonball, really, really fast. And now let's look at the hobos. Um, during the, well, they, there were hobos around a lot. But it got much worse during the, the United States Depression era. Say a man was in Midwest someplace. His family's on the verge of starving. I hear there are jobs in Kansas or in California. How am I going to get there? I can't afford to buy a ticket. So he watches, and then a train is just accelerating, coming out of the station. He runs along, jumps into a boxcar, rides as far as that train goes. Hopefully he can jump out before the yard bull beats him up. And then, you know, maybe he's run out of food and money. So he goes through town, knocking on doors, either begging or asking for work. Maybe he could find someone who would let him do farm work. Uh, hoe the potatoes, shovel the manure. Let him sleep in the hay, give him some food until he got on his way again. Many towns didn't want these hobos. You know, they were a real problem. Some of them weren't looking for a job or a handout. They were looking to steal. So many towns passed rules, ordinances, forcing those unemployed drifters out of town. And so they accumulated at the city limits right next to the railroad track. So hopefully the train would be going slowly as it came through, and they'd see a boxcar that was open, and they'd jump on. And if not, they'd just wait for the next one. And these encampments were typically called the hobo jungle. Okay, there's your jungle, the hobo jungle. From the great, no, I'm not going to sing it yet. From the great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific shore, from sunny California to ice-bound Labrador. She's mighty tall and handsome. She's known quite well by all. She's the Bose accommodation on the Wabash Cannon Wall. The controversy comes in the last line. Um, Bose is, of course, abbreviation for hobos. The original versions, of course, they're not available in writing. They were just legends, people singing them. It's the hobo's accommodation, a place where he lived. And then that got shortened down, apostrophe accommodation. It's the bo's accommodation. And then they began singing it wrong, saying handsome combination. <laughs> and so people thought this was a railroad song because she's mighty and she's handsome and she's strong. It's a handsome combination, the Wabash Cannonball. No. It's the Bose accommodation on the Wabash Cannonball. From the great Pacific Ocean to the wild Pacific shore, from sunny California to ice-bound Labrador. She's mighty tall and handsome. She's known quite well by all. She's the Bose accommodation on the Wabash Cannonball. Oh, listen to the jingle, the jumble, rumble, and the roar. Our eastern states are dandy. <laughs> hang on, hang on, let me get the scratch right here. Okay. Oh, listen to the jingle, the rumble, and the roar. She glides along the rootland, o'er the hills and by the shore. She climbs the flowery mountain, hear the lonely hobos call. We're rolling through the jungle on the Wabash Cannonball. Now that you know the background, that makes sense. Our eastern states are dandy, so the people always say. From New York to St. Louis and Chicago by the way. From the hills of Minnesota where the rippling waters fall. No changes can be taken on the Wabash Cannonball. Oh, listen to the jingle, the rumble, and the roar. 
She glides along the woodland, o'er the hills and by the shore. She climbs the flowery mountain, near the lonely hobo fall. We're rolling through the jungle on the Wabash Cannonball. There are about 25 verses to that song. Literally, about that. Um, the last verse is always about somebody passing away and being taken care of by the Wabash Cannonball. There are a lot of names that get used in this first sentence. Um, I chose Daddy Claxton for two reasons. One is Daddy Claxton was the version I first heard long, long ago. And the other is Daddy Claxton has an old, old uh, legend attached to him that I just made up this last week. <laughs> Daddy Claxton was one of these guys who enjoyed being a hobo. So he traveled around the country just looking for odds and ends of work, bumming around. And all the hobos knew Daddy Claxton. He was older than all the rest, and they called him Daddy Claxton. And eventually, Daddy Claxton passed away. And what happens to a hobo when he passes away? The Wabash Cannonball comes to get him. Here's to Daddy. Here's to Daddy Claxton. May his name forever stand. And always be remembered by those throughout the land. His earthly race is over, and the curtains round him fall. He'll carry him off to glory on the Wabash Cannonball. Now, that last line really offends the politically correct crowd. So, uh, decades ago, they began fiddling with that because you don't want to admit there's a heaven. And so, they started saying, carry him off to victory. Victory? There wasn't a fight. Carry him off to Dixie? No. But what if he was already in Dixie? <coughs> the original seems to have been carry him home to glory on the Wabash Cannonball. Oh, listen to the jingle, the rumble, and the roar. She slides around the mountain, or the hills and by the shore. She climbs the flowery mountain, near the lonely hobo's call. We're rolling through the jungle on the Wabash Cannonball. Now it gets interesting. After the Wabash Cannonball had been around for a century or so, 1968, Joan, remember this date? 1968, that was the year I bought my first ever new car, 1968. Kansas State, there was a fire that destroyed... Nichols Hall. Um, the military education department was in that hall. This was during the Vietnam War. The fire was started by people piling wooden furniture in front of the doors and then using gasoline to start the fire. No one was ever uh, found or accused. Um, the problem for us is that this fire burned all of the band's music most of their instruments. The conductor was a fellow by the name of Phil Hewitt. And uh, he just happened, in his briefcase, to have a copy of the Wabash Cannonball. Now, they had a game coming up with Syracuse, and they needed to get the band ready to play a fight song, and all the music and the instruments were gone. So they were able to get some instruments. He made copies, brought them the Wabash Cannonball, and that's how the Wabash Cannonball came to be the fight song for K-State. Uh, many other colleges play the song, but that's, that's how it got to be the important song for Kansas State. And now the one that's really, really interesting. In 1949, the Wabash Railroad wanted to institute a fast passenger service from St. Louis through Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, and on up to Detroit. And every train has to have a name. There was the Broadway Limited and so on. And they kicked all sorts of names around. And then they said, why don't we call it the Wabash Cannonball? So here we have just the opposite of what everybody thinks. The railroad, the train, was named after the song. The Wabash Cannonball was the name that was given to the, to the railroad. Uh, that train lasted, of course, till 1971 when uh, Amtrak took over 
uh, all passenger trains in the United States. So to wind up, oh, listen to the jingle, the rumble, and the roar as she glides along the woodland or the hills and by the shore. She climbs the flowery mountain, hear the lonely hobos call. We're rolling through the jungle on the Wabash Cannonball. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. The second longest largest longest longest. railroad trestle longest. in the world is in Indiana. I did not know that. Where is it? Outside of Bloomfield. Outside of Bloomfield. Bloomington. West of Bloomington. Okay. No, I did not know that. Longest ones in France. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, as as I was doing this, the spell checker kept bugging me. I was writing trestle and it wouldn't work. It turns out there's an extra T in trestle that I have never pronounced. We were sitting at dinner that night and I said something and Joan said, well yeah, doesn't everybody know that? I don't know that I'll be, I'll, yeah, I'll give it, I'll, I'll do another one. Ah, yes. Wabash Cannonball. There's some memorabilia up here. And, uh, I'll, why don't we spread that out to anyone who wants to see it, can come up and see it. There's a ticket. Um, at some undisclosed date, Roger Olson will be doing lectures in this room on heredity, on genealogy. Okay, so watch the schedule. That's coming up. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.